with James Bond. For the longest time, sequels had the reputation of being letdowns. Not that everything about them necessarily sucked, but that they certainly failed to be solid follow-ups to their acclaimed predecessors. Jaws 2, The Exorcist 2, More American Graffiti, Son of the Mask, and Blues Brothers 2000 come to my mind when talking about poor encores. Yet these days, thankfully, it's not hard to cite examples of great sequels. The Godfather Part 2, Star Trek The Wrath of Khan, The Dark Knight, Lord of the Rings The Two Towers, A Shot in the Dark, The Empire Strikes Back, Mad Max The Road Warrior. The list is growing larger and larger with each passing year. And this certainly is the case with From Russia With Love. Dr. No was already an excellent first try, but Russia builds upon its successes, cements more of the typical Bond elements, and ups the scale and scope. And beyond that, it's just a darn good spy film. For years, this was my favorite of the entire series, and I know I'm not alone in giving it that distinction. This was Connery's favorite of all of his Bond films, as well as being the favorite of many Bond alumni, like later Bond's Timothy Dalton and Daniel Craig, which is not surprising given the tones of their respective films, producer Harry Saltzman, writer Richard Maybaum, Lois Maxwell, Michael G. Wilson, and Barbara Broccoli. Cubby Broccoli cited this as one of his three favorite entries. President John F. Kennedy listed the book as being a favorite of his. Even Ian Fleming at one time claimed this to be the best of his novels. Heck, the producers even used the bedroom scene with Tatiana and Bond as part of the screen testing process for each new actor to this day. So as you can imagine, this is quite a daunting film to tackle. But I'm going to do my level best to try and dissect this film and explain to you why I think it deserves to be remembered as one of the greats. Russia features what is, to my mind, one of the best plotted stories of the entire series. A beautiful Russian cipher clerk has found a file photo of James Bond and has fallen in love with him. She wants to defect to the West as long as Bond brings her in himself. The enticement is that she'll be bringing along a lector decoding machine which would enable MI6 to decode any messages they intercept from the Soviets. M and Bond know this is very likely a trap, but the chance of getting a lector is too much to pass up. Little do all parties involved know that it's the organization Spectre that is behind this plot, and plans to humiliate MI6, kill Tanya, and get revenge on Bond for killing their operative Dr. No. Bond heads to Istanbul and gets embroiled in the espionage game with the Russians, all the while with Spectre waiting in the shadows for their chance to emerge victorious against the survivors. This is an example of a model sequel, in that it builds upon the first film's ideas and story and deepens the experience. You don't have to have seen Dr. No in order to understand this film, but it's made very clear that Bond's involvement in the story is precisely because of his actions from the first film. Often in this series, Bond is solely involved in the story because he's the agent MI6 sends out. I think it's a far more interesting hook when Bond has a personal stake in the mission or is in some way tied to the plot. The world also starts to feel a little bigger here. We get a better sense of what Spectre is in relation to the world governments at the time, a third party that is loyal to no one but themselves and sows chaos wherever they can. Certainly Spectre isn't finished by the end of the story, but you know that they are lurking in the shadows and will be back to finish off Bond at some point in a future film. We also get our first glimpse of Blofeld, which now gives us a trajectory for the series to build towards. Russia also, intentionally or otherwise, cements some more of the standard elements of the Bond formula. The gun barrel is definitively made part of the opening of almost all subsequent films. We get a pre-credit sequence. 
The titles involve a gorgeous song that is interwoven throughout the score of the film and also features wonderful images integrated with the credits. We get our first proper gadget, as well as the introduction of Desmond Llewellyn and his cue. John Barry sets forth a great example of a Bond score. Bond has a separate female companion for almost every film to follow. The villains have a fantastic henchman, and the end of the film promises that James Bond will return. I really think Goldfinger is the true template for the rest of the series to follow, but that film is certainly building off of the elements from both Dr. No and from Rush With Love. A key difference between this and some of the other films in the series is where the emphasis is placed. When asked about how to keep the audience engaged with films, some filmmakers simplify the issue by saying, we need more action, twists and turns, and great visuals. While those are wonderful tools to be used to keep interest in the story, the first three Connery films prove that there are more ways beyond these to tell a different kind of Bond story with each film. Dr. No is an investigation story, Goldfinger focuses a bit more on escapist entertainment and action, and From Rush With Love is a tension-filled Cold War story. The thrills delivered here are not because of great stunts or action sequences, although there are a few really good ones here, but because of the layout of the plot. It's the intrigue that captivates us. We know Spectre is in the background and Bond will have to face off with them at some point, but the ball's entirely in their court. It's quite a risky move not to have the protagonist drive the events of the film forward like we had in Dr. No and like we will have in Goldfinger. Yet Bond is such a great vessel that we can still be entertained knowing that he is playing Spectre's game for much of the film. That's what makes the train fight so monumental. It's not that it's just a great fight scene in a film that's been rather devoid of action up to that point. It's a scene that changes the course of the narrative in a meaningful way. Bond finally gets the upper hand and starts to fight back against Spectre, and they are dealt another solid blow in their machinations. Sean Connery is just spectacular here. He did a phenomenal job already, but in this film he grows even more confident in the role. He just is Bond. His sense of style, his humor, his assuredness, and his charm are all near the top of the peak for Bond actors. The bedroom scene is probably the single most sexy scene in all of the classic run of films. I think this is the moment when the audience all decide how they are going to view this character. They either want to be him, or they want to be with him. And yet, somewhat incredibly, Connery gets even better in the next film. But we'll save that for another day. Tanya is a solid Bond woman, and an interesting one to compare to her immediate predecessor. Whereas Honey Rider was only involved in the third act, and even then as someone to accompany Bond, Tanya is a central character here. She's the one that kills Kleb, makes sure that Spectre cannot get their hands on the Lecter, and even decides to follow through with her cover story. I'm with Calvin Dyson in that I'm not sure when she actually falls in love with Bond, but I'm fairly certain it has to be before she admits it to Bond in the train. Daniela Bianchi fulfills a tall order in performing this role. She hardly spoke English, and she was only 21 when she did this film, I think thus making her the youngest actress to play a Bond woman. Her dubbing is pretty solid throughout, but there are certainly some moments where I can tell it's not her voice. Barbara Jefford performed the vocals here, and she would even be brought back to dub other women in the series, including Molly Peters in Thunderball, and apparently Caroline Monroe in The Spy Who Loved Me. It was probably right that the Bond series continued onwards with a new woman every installment, but I wish I knew what happened to Tanya after this story. She's unceremoniously dropped and we never hear from her again, which is odd given that she only really defected to the West because of Bond. I get why Honey Ryder might not come back. She was tied into the Jamaican area and had no reason to follow Bond back to England, but Tanya does, and so I'm a bit thrown off with the choice of never mentioning her again. The Fleming books often came up with reasons why the main Bond woman of the previous story couldn't be back for this adventure, so I'm not sure why the producers decided to go this route. I do love the hints we get from Tanya that she's enjoying the switch up to a western style of life, with her fascination of the fancy clothes and seeming to offer up fantasies of what her life will eventually be like. In the novel, Fleming certainly wrote with this attitude of, the West rocks. 
It's interesting to compare Tanya with Red Grant there, as I think they're intended to complement each other. They're both agents for Smirsh who are thoroughly committed to communist ideals. The film series chooses to de-emphasize these political aspects, and while that makes the film adaptations of the original stories less interesting to analyze on a thematic level, I think it was ultimately the right move. Covey Broccoli felt that the Cold War wasn't going to last forever, and thus avoided explicitly making certain nations the enemies for Bond. It's a forward-thinking attitude that actually helps to make the series feel more timeless. If you know the Cold War, you can appreciate the atmosphere and tensions that permeated the series well into the 1980s. However, if you decide to detach your viewing experience from that part of history, these films still work surprisingly well for a casual audience. I've already said a lot about what I wanted to cover with Red Grant in my recent Bond Henchman ranking video, so I won't spend a lot of time on him here. Suffice it to say, he is the standout villain for the film. He doesn't even speak until 80 minutes in, and yet he's the first villain that comes to my mind when I think of this film. Rosa Klebb works very well for being the principal Spectre agent of the story, but she personally doesn't have a whole lot of color for me. Again, if you know the book, you can read into certain performance choices of Loti Lenya's in order to enrich the character, but I can't tell if these choices were Lenya's ideas or if they were in the screenplay. I also love Blofeld's presence here. He's not really necessary for the story itself, but his appearance is a great foundational element for later entries, seeding the eventual climax between him and Bond. The weak link here is Kronstein. Vladik Shabal gives a creepy performance, but I feel like he's just here to force the chess master image into the story. I feel like he could have been cut out or condensed with someone else. The 2005 video game adaptation gives a lot of his lines to Kleb, which makes sense given that she was head of strategic operations for Smirsh. I think inserting this character into the mix was an oversight on the writer's parts, though I'm inclined to blame Joanna Harwood as she claimed in a later interview that anything resembling the original story came from her and Kronstein was a character there. Alongside Red Grant, my favorite new character here is Karen Bay. Pedro Amandares brings a lot of the same warmth and likability to the character as was in the book. He's the guide for the audience to this world and I love his rapport with Bond. He's right up there with Jeffrey Wright's interpretation of Felix Leiter as someone I wish I could have seen team up with Bond for more adventures. I think my favorite bit with him is when he kills Krilenku. It's such a tense scene and Amandaris plays it very well. The MI6 regulars still do a great job here. This is probably my favorite M scene with Connery as it feels more like a frank conversation than a standard briefing. Money Penny also gets some of her best moments here. I'll repeat a point I made in my Dr. No review. Lois Maxwell and Sean Connery just had the best chemistry of any of the Bond Money Penny pairings. Desmond Llewellyn makes his first appearance as Boothroyd, but it's not really a scene that's treated with much fanfare. Now, to be fair, this was a scene that was written for Peter Burton, but when he couldn't return, Desmond stepped in. He's a little bit more animated in his facial expressions than Burton was, and so he endears himself to the audience more, and I'm happy he came back for later installments. I've said before that this isn't an action film, really, but there are some noteworthy moments here. The Gypsy Camp fight comes to mind, as it's a great example of how an action scene can be used to illustrate the film's themes on a visual scale. The fight is a microcosm of the larger story, in that the Russians are fighting against Bond and his allies, but Spectre will nudge it along however they need to. I also like the boat chase, as it leads to some of the best shots in the series, but the real standout should be obvious. It's the confrontation between Grant and Bond. It not only contains one of the best fight scenes in all of cinema, but it does a great job of giving us enough of Grant's character so that we're invested in the stakes of the fight. Grant is a true anti-Bond, with all of the training, skills, and confidence, but he just happens to work on the side of evil. It's only when he veers from his job and allows his own personal ambitions into the arena that Bond is able to take advantage of him. This scene has so many great moments of dialogue that are some of my favorites in the series. Robert Shaw and Sean Connery show off their theater acting chops here, and it's hard not to be silenced into captivation. My hair just stands up on end. 
The fight afterwards is an example of more bloody combat that I just adore seeing. You can feel the sweat and exertion from each of these guys. The blows hit hard, and we're excited to see Bond find a way to get the upper hand in the fight. I also want to talk about the suitcase here. It's one of my favorite gadgets in the series. It was featured in the book, but the creativity on display with it here is just inspired. The features are general enough that we can see how it might be useful to field agents in a variety of situations, and yet a lot of them fit perfectly within this plot. Not all of the features are used later in the story, but I really dig that. Sometimes the series features a gadget that feels like it was just made for the one specific scene in which Bond needs it and then it might be discarded almost immediately. This briefcase was the breakthrough for all gadgets to follow and I wouldn't mind Bond still having something like this around for future adventures. Sid Kane takes over art direction duties from Ken Adam. While it does have some unique touches of its own, it feels like it's part of the same world as Dr. No, thus building a sense of cohesion with this series. Kane would be brought back to work on several later Bond adventures, basically whenever they couldn't get Ken here. He also designed Honor Majesty's Secret Service, Live and Let Die, and would even be a storyboarded artist as late as Goldeneye. Peter Hunt is the real MVP of the crew here. It's widely known that this film was heavily reworked in the editing process, and I really appreciate how well Hunt knows the ebbs and flows of movie storytelling. Plus, I hear he's responsible for the reason we have a pre-title sequence, and I can't imagine this series without that staple. However, there are a couple of bits where the editing stands out. Certainly, there are speed-ups and jump cuts, but there are certain lines which don't make sense. There's a line from Bond regarding Grant's supposed comments about the film reel that doesn't make sense as that particular bit was excised from the train sequence. Also, Tanya has a line to Bond about an agent following them while they're on the boat in Istanbul, but of course we don't see any agent following them. I also have to give a shout out to Robert Brownjohn. While Maurice Binder often gets the credit for the Bond title sequences, I think Brownjohn deserves some credit too. Binder's sequence for Dr. No always felt a bit jarring to me, whereas Brown John's sequence here feels much more fitting. He decides to go for projections on women's figures, which is a simple idea that is later refined for Goldfinger, and yet I feel like the first title sequence that would become the template for later films, Thunderball, works because Binder takes Brown John's ideas and reimagines them to work in his own wheelhouse. I've already spoken a bit about John Barry's score elsewhere, but I can't help but sing its praises once again. This is totally different from Monty Norman's effort, and it's a much more fitting one. The lush strings, the quiet suspense pieces, and the implementation of the percussion all help to give this film its own unique sound while setting the course for the rest of the series. The instrumental versions of the main theme are my preferred versions of the song, and it's one of the most hummable themes for me. Having bongos was a great way to keep the more exotic nature of Istanbul in the music. It's not exactly what the Turkish traditional musical character sounds like, but it's a great way of keeping one foot in that world. The string segments reminds me a bit more of great musical scores at the time, like Lawrence of Arabia, which helps to add to the film's mystique for me. Barry's integration of the Bond theme is great here, too. The James Bond with bongos piece always stuck with me. However, it's not the only place where Barry uses the theme. It's in the pre-title sequence, it's in the main title sequence, it's a transitionary piece of music, and it plays in one of my favorite subtler ways when Bond throws the man overboard. I also adore the Hagia Sophia suspense piece. Great job, Barry. You've secured yourself a standing invitation to come back and do 10 more films. There are a few more bits that I don't feel work as well as they should. The gypsy camp sequence is great, but I feel like the segment with the girl fight goes on a bit too long. I love the belly dancer bit and wouldn't change that, and I adore the shootout later, but I felt the length of the combined sequence a bit on my most recent rewatch, so I probably would have trimmed it there. I also think the train fight does such a good job that it overshadows the rest of the film that follows it. It's not that the third act suddenly becomes bad, it just lulls a bit for me in excitement. I do love the helicopter bit though. Yeah, it's an obvious lift from Hitchcock, but I like the change from a plane to a helicopter. It makes the scene feel a bit faster, and you can make the passes more often and get them closer to Bond. 
As I've said, this score is incredible, but the one bit I feel like the music needed a bit more work was in the hotel scene where Bond searches for bugs. Bringing back the original arrangement of the James Bond theme is fine, but I hate how the volume levels for the song are all over the place. Sometimes it feels far too soft, and other times it's far too loud. I feel like that bit needed another couple of passes from the mixing people. Finally, I'd like to point out that I do not believe this is Ian Fleming. I wish he had made a more explicit appearance in this series, but I found far too much evidence against this particular person being the original author. From Russia With Love is a terrific follow-up to Dr. No that I believe surpasses it. It's such a classic in the eyes of the public that it's often held alongside Goldfinger as one of the ultimate examples of Bond films. I was a bit apprehensive coming back to this one, as I'm worried the luster and magic of this film will fade on repeat viewings, but once again, that fear was unwarranted. This is the only Bond film I currently own in a digital format, and it's a pleasure to revisit the film every so often. I personally hold it up as one of the great films of the 1960s for cinephiles, alongside the likes of Lawrence of Arabia, 2001 A Space Odyssey, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and Psycho. From Rush With Love was another indication of the oncoming phenomenon, and yet it wouldn't be until the next film when the dam would burst open and the spy deluge will drown us all. But we'll talk about that film another day.